All right, now, if there's anything wrong with your pastor, you can blame it on me because I trained him. <laughs> and uh, I'm not worried about titles. I call myself the Lord's junkyard dog. That's what I call myself. The Lord put me in a junkyard, and there's an old Bible in there people were messing with, and the Lord said, I want you to guard this book, and if somebody comes over the fence, bite the britches out. That's what I've been doing for about 54 years, biting the britches out. You ever see a junkyard dog? They're not usually not thoroughbred, not, not Dobermans or German Shepherds usually. They're kind of mongrels, they're just medium sized or small. But that way, when they come up, they don't wag your tail at you. And the first thing you know, they go, <laughs> like I, you know, that's what I'm called to do. And uh, I do it. All right, now let's get up to date here and see where we're at. And I don't want to have you misunderstand me this morning. My people are military people. Grandfather, general, Philippine insurrection, uh, fathers of colonel, World War II, captain, World War I, brothers of sergeant, World War II. I was a shave tailor, World War II. I'm red, white, and blue, but I'm a Christian. And I'm a Christian. I've got a book. And this book was given to me in 1949. Never saw one until then, until I was 27 years old with a college education. Until I'd read the Koran through and studied the Shastas and the Biranas and the Bhagavad Gita and the Kama Sutra and the whole stinking mess overseas, including Buddhism and Buddhism and Prajna and certain Nirvana and enlightenment, all that junk. And in March of 1949, I got over the Bible and got saved. And I got reading the Bible and then I learned something pretty quick. And uh, I still know it to be true. And it's, we'll start here this morning, real negative. Matter of fact, you're going to hear more negative stuff in the next 30 minutes than you've heard in the last six years. Uh, because uh, the Bible is always right and man is always wrong. Now, see this little thing right here? That don't look like much, does it? That's the Middle East, that's Palestine, that's Jerusalem. All history begins and ends there. What about American history? It doesn't exist. Turn to Isaiah chapter 40. What about European history? No such thing. <laughs> well, Asiatic history doesn't count. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, and come down there. I don't have the verses marked, but I want a verse down there that says, The nations are less than a drop in a bucket. What verse is that? What is it? 17. Now, they're even less than that. The nations, the United Nations, keep on reading, are less than nothing. Where is that? Seven. What is it? That seven. Less than nothing. You know what that is? We used to call that a cipher with a rim knocked off. That's a zero. In mathematics, you know what you study? You study minus one, minus two, minus three. You know what America is in God's sight? An absolute blank. You know what God's sight is as far as Germany is concerned? Italy and Spain and France and Russia and China? There's nothing there. They're just a pile of heathen. First Corinthians says the three kinds of people, they're Jew, they're Gentiles, and there's the church. The body of Christ is neither Jew nor Gentile. Outside of the body of Christ, there's Jew and the Gentile. What about the Gentile? They're heathen in the Bible. Numbers chapter 23 says Israel will not be numbered among the nations. And today Israel is in the UN, so you're going to have to kick it out. It's not to be numbered among the nations. You say, why? Because the, le the nations are less than nothing. You see, if you're an American, you're aware of the fact that you got blessed in this country, and God knows you do. My, my parish runs from Bombay and Hyderabad and Seoul and uh, Manila up to Fort Worth and Dallas and New York and Canada and Mexico and God knows where. I, my, my plane mileage is 40000 a year. I've been up in the air alone with a seagull with sore feet. <laughs> and it runs 40000 a year for 50 years. And I know the condition other countries are in. Now, I know God has blessed this country, but he's through blessing it. You can sing God bless America, you're red, blue, and white, and blue in the face, but God in that book doesn't bless nations that live like we're living. How much you want to bet? I'll give you 500 verses just like that. You, th you know what God did with his own chosen people, the Jew? He drove them out, burned the city, and did away with them for something like 1,900 years. And you think America has a privilege that you doesn't have? That's where you come into it, see. Well, now see this thing here? The last thing that happens before eternity begins is the white throne judgment. That'll be Revelation 20. Do you know what happens right before Revelation 20? Why don't you? 
And that's where, that's where time ends. It ends with the end of the millennium, the white throne judgment. You know where it ends? It ends right there. Satan went out and gathered the nations together, nations like Gog and Magog of the sand of the sea, and they had come to the beloved city round about, and fire came down from heaven and destroyed them all. And I saw a great white throne, him that sat upon it, from all his face to heaven and earth fell away, and no place found with them, and I saw the dead small and great stand for God. You're out of history. History ends there. See? Now history, I'm not talking about prehistory. Prehistory doesn't exist. Prehistory is Disney World. <laughs> I'm on history. An encyclopedia will have written history beginning in 4,000 B.C. Some of them make it 5,000 B.C. An encyclopedia knows when the writing starts. It starts with Archbishop Usher's date in Genesis, <laughs> about 4,000 B.C. You know where history begins? Right there. Kuwait. Bosra. Why don't you know that? You open your Bible, your Bible tells in Genesis that God put Adam in a garden eastward. In Eden. Where's Eden? Well, in Genesis chapter 2, he t says one of the rivers of the Euphrates. In Genesis 2. He tells the other one is Hiddekel. You turn to Ezekiel and you'll find that Ezekiel is by Hiddekel. Hiddekel, he's over in here. Hiddekel is the Tigris River. The garden is like this. Or Eden like that. And the garden is planted eastward of Eden. Gihon went down here to uh, uh, Ethiopia. Pison went off here into Arabia. There were two more rivers there. And when they went over there and fought in Kuwait, the, air, the, air, the photographers in the air corps went over there and photographed the place and found two dry riverbeds that hadn't been there for centuries. Flood almost obliterated them right through there. You know where you began your life? Persian Gulf. You know where you are in history right now? You're in Genesis 2. That's where you are. He made man out of the dust of the ground. Where is it? It's eastward in Eden. How do you know it's Eden? You don't think it's Eden because when God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, it's right there. Ur of the Chaldees, it's right there. He had him go up the Euphrates and his daddy Haran died up here and he came down here. When he got down to here, this place here, the Lord said, uh, I'm going to give you this place, the whole place, and I'm going to give this whole place from the River of Egypt, Genesis 15. The river of Egypt, that's the Nile, to the great river Euphrates. That's Israel. It ain't the West Bank and the East Bank. That's Israel right there. That's what God promised Abraham. You know what that's called in Psalm 105? In Psalm 105, that's called an everlasting covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not Isaac. Jacob and Jacob's sons. But that's the peace. And in the millennium when Christ comes back, these 12 tribes will have a place where the desert blossomed like a rose. And that's not up around where the artificial irrigation is around Galilee that uh, uh, the, your expositors, Lindsay and Tex Mars and the rest of them try to kid you on. That desert blossomed like a rose, the Arabian desert. That thing right there. And when the tribes come back, that's the piece of ground. Now, it's the thing right there. If he went up where Noah got out of the ark, and he got up here in Ararat and ran that thing down, like this somewhere, Shem would get that side, and Ham would get everything under him there, and Japheth would get everything over there. Europeans over here. Orientals over here. And Africans down here. Like that. Now the trouble with Christians is, uh, most Christians in America is, they're what we call biblically literate, and it comes from bad teaching in the schools. For example, the, what is the main theme of the Bible? Say it's Christ. Well, that's the main person in the Bible. What's the main theme? Folks say salvation. That ain't even a fifth of it. If you ever stop thinking about this when you pick up your Bible, uh, you're raised in the New Testament, believe in the New Testament. Uh, Book of Revelation, some of those epistles there are kind of in the tribulation people, but we'll take the whole Old Testament for a Christian. And there's what you've got for a Bible. There's the Bible. Right there. You've got less than one fourth of it. Folks, well, God's all through. No, He isn't through. Turn to Romans chapter 11. He's starting. He's starting. 
Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, and look there at verse 26. That's a warning by Paul to the Gentiles, and the whole chapter is to the Gentiles, yet not to an individual Christian. That parable of the olive tree and the wild olive tree and the good olive tree has nothing to do with an individual losing their salvation. It's talking about Gentiles and Israel. All right, Romans chapter 11, verse 26. And all Israel shall be saved. When? When Jesus Christ comes back, verse 26, and turns ungodliness away from who? From who, folks? Jacob. Got nothing to do with spiritual salvation. They got nothing to do with the Israel of God. Jacob. That's the father of the twelve tribes. His name's Israel. All right, now where are you? Look at verse 25. I would not, brethren, you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles may come in, and it's all Israel, not Isaac, not Isaac's spiritual seed, Christ. no, no, a nation, Israel, should be saved. Now, if you're not careful in, uh, with that thing, look what's going to happen. Verse 18, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. And I will say they were broken off, that I might be grafted in well, because of unbelief they were broken off. Verse 21, if God spared not the natural branches, Israel, take heed lest he spare not thee, the Gentiles, therefore behold the goodness and severity of God. Now, what is God going to do? I know what he's going to do. I know exactly what he's going to do. You say, well, Ruck, when you think you're right and everybody else is wrong, exactly. <laughs> I mean, if I've got it in print and the Lord said it, I can be absolutely certain of it. I'll read your future here this morning. I pray for the Lord to come back every day. Every day I get up, I say, I hope it's today. <laughs> well, I said, you just want the Lord to come, Ruckman, because you're not because you love him, because you're scared. And I say, you got my number. <laughs> I know what's coming. Now, all around Chicago, they're driving down these highways back and forth. We're worried about the taxes, worry about the billing program, worry about the gasoline, worry about the income, worry about Iraq and Iran, and all this junk. And they don't know, and of course, I'm here with you. When the axe falls, it's going to hit me just as well as you. But the axe is going to fall if the Lord tarries. Turn to Zephaniah chapter 3, and when you find it, raise your hand. Zephaniah 3, when you find it, raise your hand. I want to see what you've been reading. Zephaniah 3, you've got a hand down here. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Well, that's pretty good. Some of you better get an index. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, ever, did you ever try to memorize the books in the Bible when you went back there to Sunday school? Some of you adults now haven't, you haven't memorized them for a long time, have you? It's in the Old Testament if you're looking for it. <laughs> Zephaniah chapter 3. Brother Huff, would you read us the verse? Read us verse 8 real loud and clear. Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. My determination is to gather the nation. What? What? His determination is to what? Gather the nations. How about that? United Nations. That's God's determination. Go ahead. That I may assemble the kingdom. Whoa! United Nations Assembly. What are you... Upon them my indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. The UN is gathered to kill them. That's why God gathered them. No little twin tower stuff. That's kid stuff. He's going to get the whole crew. Bind the tares in bundles to burn them. Matthew 13. You what about the United States? No problem there. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 30. You burn up with the rest of them. Jeremiah chapter 30. Folks talk about the sheep and goat nations. There are no sheep and goat nations. There are nations gathered together and he takes sheep and goats out of those nations and sets them on the right hand and left. They're not two set, sets of nations there. Every nation there is anti-Semitic in the tribulation. You take out of those the individuals who treated the Jew right. But the nations, they go down the drain. Uh, Brother Huff, read us real loud, uh, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 11. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. I say Israel. Though I make the full end of all nations. What? Full end of all nations. Uh, how many nations? All well, go ahead. Whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not 
make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. You understand? And to use New York, any nation where they're scattered, I'm going to clean them, clean them off the map. Now, don't look and blink at me. I mean, I can't help you been spending watching the boob tube and the glass toilet <laughs> instead, of, instead of reading your book. Read your book. Amen. You folks are saved, but saved people in America today, they've quit reading the Old Testament. You're acting like it's over. It's starting. It's starting. Well, now, getting back here, history ends... There. Your history begins, begins there. So, all history is encompassed in the Middle East. And that's where all your news media is now, in the Middle East. You know what that shows you? That shows you, when we're talking about the imminence of the Lord's coming, now it ought to be breathing down your neck, because you can't go any further backwards. History began right there. And it ends right there. So history as it is, Old Testament, New Testament, the spread of the gospel, Protestant Reformation, Old United States, missionary stuff here, missionary revival in California, Billy Graham, revival in Korea, Korean War, revival over India going on right now, coming this way, now you come here, now you come here, now you're sitting here, there ain't no place to go but there, and you're all through. You, and you can't go any further than there. That's when that, where Adam was made, out of the ground. You're through. There's a thing we call in, in Bible hermeneutics, there's a thing we call, we call it uh, the law of first mention. And the law of first mention simply means that you want to watch in your Bible for the first time a word shows up, because thereafter it will have that application. For example, the first shepherd in the Bible is who? First shepherd. Abel. Type of Christ. So, shepherds generally are going to be good. Abraham's a shepherd. Joseph is a shepherd. Isaac's a shepherd. Jacob's a shepherd. Moses is a shepherd. David's a shepherd. Jesus Christ, the good shepherd. Now, you pick up your Bible. Where does the word sinner first occur in the Bible? You haven't got any idea. Christians don't read the Bibles. Where does the word sinner first? I'm not talking about scholarship. You have to be a scholar to find out where a word occurs in the Bible. Well, you've got a fourth grade education, you can find it. The thing is, you ain't looking for it. <laughs> now, you take sinner in the Bible. Where does it first occur? Anybody? Yeah, you got it. 1313. Look out for them 13s. You know what it's referenced to? It's referenced to a faggot. <laughs> Isn't that something? When a sinner is defined in the Bible, it's a sex pervert. You don't believe it? Go look it up, man. Don't take my word for it. Don't you believe a word I'm telling you. Look it up. Genesis 13. You know where the word love first occurs in the Bible? Of course you don't. Shouldn't you? Uh, this this sex-crazy, uh, love-mad country, love, 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 and all the preachers are enough love. You need more love and love, love. You don't even know where the word came from, do you? You know where love first occurs in that book you got in your hand? It occurs in Genesis 22. And it has nothing to do with a man loving a woman or a woman loving a man. The whole thing is off. The first time love occurs in your Bible has nothing to do with a woman loving her child. The first crack in that book where God says, Love says, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and offer him for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. It's a picture of a man's love for his son. You say, Why? Because here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his son. You see? I could pick up my Bible one day and I thought to myself, I wonder where the word holy first occurs. And I read through Genesis, you know, the hundred time or hundred and thirty or forty, fifty, I forget which. And coming through there, I was looking for this word holy and it didn't occur anywhere in Genesis. Nothing holy in Genesis. God's there, but doesn't say he's holy. Holy Spirit's there, but it doesn't, doesn't say holy. Just the Spirit. I couldn't find anything holy in Genesis. Not even the prophecies on Christ. 
And I got to Exodus chapter 3, you know what he said? He said to Moses, he said, take off your shoes off of your feet, because the ground you stand on is holy. And Moses is right there, Mount Sinai. The first thing God ever said holy on this earth was not Holy Mary, or Holy Mother of God, or the Holy Church, or Holy Ramadan, or Holy Easter Bunny, or Holy Christmas. The first thing God said was holy was a piece of dirt right there. Now, do you know how strange that is? When God drove Adam and Eve out of that garden, he said, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. And the first thing he called holy was something he cursed. Just like that. The ground you stand on is holy. Take your shoes off your feet. Then he makes that ark down there. The ark of the covenant is made down there. And he comes down off the mountain. And boy, they got that golden calf. And 3,000 people die there. Killed. It's holy ground. It's bloodstained. Got 3,000 people dead on it. And they take that ark. And that Jew wanders in that wilderness for 40 years. And he carries that ark with him over here. And carries that ark over here. And 22,000 die here. And 25,000 there. And Dathan and Abiram go down to the pit alive. And the fire comes out. And the serpents bite them with that ark. And the ark goes right up to here, the king's highway, comes across here to Gilgal and to Joshua, and the Lord says to Joshua and Gilgal, take your shoes off your feet, because the ground you stand on is holy. When you say something holy, that doesn't mean anything. That's just a bunch of junk. The holy Koran, well, put it in the garbage. Because you say it's holy, I don't mean it's holy. If I said the scriptures were holy, that wouldn't mean anything. Except the scriptures said that. Romans 1, 2, the Holy Scriptures. Daniel 10, the Scripture of Truth. Just because the fellow says so, I don't mean that. Now where that ark goes is bloodshed, and that ark settles right in Jerusalem. And old Solomon says, all the places the, the ark has traveled, it went with Joshua. <laughs> and when Joshua came in, that ark went all over there like that. And about uh, 2 million Canaanites, Jebusites, Hittites, Amorites, Hivites got killed. That's holy. When the Lord said that land is the holy land, he said it, not the Pope. The Lord said it. Take your Bible and turn to Psalm chapter 2. We're just getting the background. This is the introduction. We haven't gotten to the message yet. <laughs> Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2. Now look it up. Nothing like a Bible to clear up a college education. Oh yeah, man. Oh yeah. I've had as much education, I've got, I got much education any neurosurgeon you got in the state of Illinois. And I, if I had the faculty of Tubingen right here, and the faculty of Edinburgh sitting right here, and the faculty of Berkeley and uh, Chicago, and the seminaries at Louisville and Denver and that bunch, and, and Fort Worth and that bunch, and had Pillsbury and, and Bob Jones and Tennessee Temple and Liberty Baptist College and Crown College sitting right here, I'd spit in those faculty bunch and drop them in one, one spit. They'd drown in it. Uh, you say, well, you must, must have much education. I had plenty of education. It just didn't take. <laughs> my color med, my color maid said to me one time, said, law me, doctor, me, me to tell you, me, you got a PhD. I said, that's right. She said, law me to hear you preach one wouldn't think you had no education at all. <laughs> I consider that a compliment. I really do. All right, I see this thing here. He said, Psalm 2, you got Psalm 2. I want about verse 4 or 5. Uh, yet I'll set my king upon my holy hill. What verse is that? Six. Six. See it? Who's his king? Look at the next verse. Who's that? I'll declare the decree. Who is it, folks? What? Jesus Christ. It ain't Arafat or Rabin or... Sharon, it's Jesus Christ. What's his holy hill? It's the Dome of the Rock. Right there. That's the temple area. That's where David and Solomon built the temple. Why no Muslim has any business there? That doesn't give name Muslim. That's the Muslim quarter in Jerusalem up till the Jews got back. That was the Arminian quarter, that was the Catholic quarter, and the Jew was off over here with a wailing wall sitting right in there. Well, that isn't, oh, no Catholic has any business being in Jerusalem. What's a Catholic doing in Jerusalem? You know, crucify Jesus Christ? Jerusalem. Threw him outside the city, amen? 
O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the stone is the prophets. It cannot be that a prophet perish outside of Jerusalem. What do you call that place the holy city for? The Bible calls it Sodom and Egypt. Turn to Revelation chapter 11. Nothing like a Bible to clear up a seminary education. Revelation chapter 11. Now here's Moses and Elijah coming back and preaching, and they get the heads cut off in a city, and look what that city is. Revelation chapter 11, I want a verse down there about, it must be about verse oh, 8, 9, and 10. I want a verse that says, And their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of that great city, which is called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. What verse is that? Eight. Eight. See it? Why would you want to make a pilgrimage to there? Aren't people strange? What do you want to go to Jerusalem for? That's the city murdered your Savior. You know what God called it? Sodom and Egypt. <laughs> Have a time with it, don't they? Now, you know what that book is called in that book and the book of Revelation? It's called The Beloved City. That means in Revelation chapter 11, there must be something awful wrong with that city. You know what's wrong with that city in Revelation 11? The Antichrist is there. The son of perdition is sitting on the dome of the rock. So it's called Sodom and Egypt. And after he gets knocked off and uh, the last battle takes place, they accompany the beloved city. Oh, and now history begins here, and history ends there. And the history then is going to center around those two places right there. Matter of fact, in Revelation 17, he says, Babylon the Great, and Babylon is sitting right there. Oh, and now let's get, come down here to this country here. This is the country over here. It's called the land of Canaan. It's not Palestine. The word Palestine is a, a word that is put on uh, Palestine by the Roman army occupation of 70 A.D., and that thing is called Philistia in Exodus chapter 15. It's called Philistia in the Psalms. That's where your word Palestine comes from. Your word Palestine means a Philistian, a Philist, a, the Philistines, Goliath from Ham. A genealogy in Genesis chapter 10 talks about those Philistines. They come from Ham. Egypt comes from Ham. You're told in Psalm, uh, you're told over in Psalm 105 and Psalm 106. You're to where those uh, those covenants are. You're told in Psalm 105 and 106 that Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham, the land of Ham. It's Egypt below that line. Do you know uh, what race Arafat is? Why don't you? Isn't he a Palestinian in the Palestinian Liberation Organization for Palestine, for a Palestinian state? No man. He's an Egyptian. He wasn't even born in Palestine. Why don't you know that? Because all you're fooled with is the Internet and the web. You never learn anything there. Be blind as a bat. You can't get any information there. You just get what they want to have you get. You know what his wife is? How many you know? Let me see your hands. Well, there's two or three. She's a Roman Catholic. How come you don't know that? That's dumb, stupid Christians, you know. <laughs> Sit around 10 o'clock at night watching a loose cast and you think you're getting something? You get more than that Bible in five minutes than you will any television station in the world in three days. Well, what is a Muslim doing being married to a Catholic? She doesn't believe in Allah. And she believes Christ the Son of God. I've read the Koran through 17 times. It's almost marked up as my Bible. Five times there it says, if you believe that Allah had a son, you're damned, you're cursed, you're going to hell. That's his wife. <laughs> what kind of a marriage is that? You know who his uncle was? Amin Haj Hussain. That's Arafat's uncle. He wasn't a Palestinian. He was an Egyptian. He was the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. You say when? When Churchill gave Palestine to Muhammad. You know what that bird did during World War II? He went to Berlin and stayed there in Goethe And Hitler gave him a nice apartment there and kept it there during the whole part of World War II. And that bird was handling sabotage against the English armies in North Africa when, when Rommel was there. Bird right there. Arafat's his nephew. Now, what I'm coming to, and I'll come to it all too late, but what I'm coming to is this. If anybody is in favor of giving that dome of that rock, that temple area, to any Muslim under any condition, he is anti-Semitic. 
And right now, our president and Tony Blair of the Irish Republican Army in Ireland and the Vatican all say the Palestinians should have the eastern half of Jerusalem with the Moscow Omar on top of it. That bird comes from Ishmael. You know who Ishmael's mother was? In the New Testament. At least the New Testament. The way to just be stupid is fool around with TV, radio, and magazines, and you'll never find out anything. All right, uh, get, uh, Ishmael, uh, get Ishmael in Galatians, I think it's the end of chapter 4. I want a verse there that says, What saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman or her son, for the bondwoman's son shall not be heir with my son Isaac. 430. 430. There you go, read it. Now read it, man, read it. Don't you take my word for it. Read it, that's New Testament. That's politics in the New Testament. That's politics for the 10 o'clock newscast. Muhammad said he was the 70th from Ishmael. The 70th from Ishmael. All right, the book says, kick his out of there. Cast him out. Boot him. That's what it says. Is the American government going to do it? No, sir, they're going to go into Afghanistan and get a pipeline, then work over to Syria and get them some drugs. <laughs> You know the two biggest centers of the drug traffic are? They're the, the Golden Crescent and the Golden Triangle. The Golden Triangle is where China gets all its money from. That's Cambodia and Thailand down through there. That's called the Golden Triangle. You know the Golden Crescent is? What's a crescent? You ever see a crescent moon? That's the Golden Crescent. That's where 80% of the drugs come from, right there. So Bush might be moving toward Syria before he gets through. But that ain't what the problem is. The problem's here. It always has been there. Since the war of terrorism has begun, the terrorists have doubled. Gonna triple. There are the names. The Hamas, the Hezbollah, the El the Al Fatah, the El Fatayin. The Intifada, the Uprising, the Muslim Brotherhood, and the Palestinian Liber Liberation Organization, which changed itself to the Palestinian Agency, so you'd think it was a government outfit. They even talk about the fellow being elected head of the parliament. There's no parliament in the Palestinian Liberation Organization. That's a terrorist organization for killing Jews. You're trying to make it look like a government. Now you mark what I'm telling you. You see this place right here? At Tel Aviv. You know where the American embassy is? It's in Tel Aviv. You know where every embassy of anybody's embassy, embassy's at, where the embassy is? It's where the capital is. An American embassy is in the capital. The capital of Palestine is not Tel Aviv. It's Jerusalem. What's the matter, the land of the free and home of the brave? You don't have enough guts to change it? Well, your congressman did. In 1997, when Slick Willie was pastor, <laughs> in 1997, when a fornicating scum bucket was running things, the Congress voted to move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. They didn't do it. You know what Bush said before he got in? That's one of the first things I'm going to do is move the embassy to, you lied, Bush. You're a Christian. I think he probably is a Christian. He's a good lying Christian. He didn't move it. Why didn't you move it? You're scared to get your britches shot off. You know why you're scared? You'd have a war. All you got right now is a military exercise. Blow up a few ragheads and shoot a few camel jockeys and then brag about what you did. That wouldn't make a good infantry problem in Fort Benning, that last two things you went through. You know something? When that mess went on in Kuwait, you know when I was getting over the radio? There were ten people killed in Washington, D.C. every day during that war. We had 140 people murdered in the capital. You didn't lose that many <laughs> troops in Desert Storm. <laughs> You've been safer on a tank in Desert Storm than you would have been in downtown Washington, D.C. <laughs> You've got to grow up sometime, you know. Something's got to give you the horrible truth. <laughs> now, you know why you don't move Jerusalem? You have a war in your hands. Now, I don't know a lot of things, many things I'm bad, but I know wars. I mean, the first thing I ever shot at when I was a boy coming up was not a squirrel or a rabbit or a deer. It was a silhouette of a man in a National Guard armory with a rifle. 
I was raising a home with when my daddy's idea of a big fun fun time was at night to spread out battle maps across the dining room table and, and exegete on them for three or four hours at a time, you know, with root supplies, you know, and uh, fields of fire, you know, and azimuth readings and roots of um, uh, 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 alternative action and just all that stuff. I could, I could tell you in detail about the battles at Gettysburg, and I've been on that battlefield three times, and Antietam, and uh, Sharpsburg, they call that Antietam, and Shiloh, and uh, 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 Kiev, and Odessa, and uh, Kursk Salient, and the battles for Berlin, and the battles for Stalingrad and Leningrad, and the battles of Swasone and Chateau Theory in World War I, and Bellow Woods, just like I'd recite something I'd learned in school. If you want a war, but I can tell you how to get it. Just go over there and move that embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem and sign a military alliance with Israel. And son, you'll have you a war. And against you will be half of Europe and China and Red Russia. There's an American in the world that has enough guts to take that on. You're going to mess around the bushes. Do you realize, brethren, there's only one country in the U.N. that has no military allies? Why is that? Isn't that strange? There's only one country that has no military ally. It's Israel. Oh, I know this thing right here. See this thing here? That's the kingdom. You see this thing right here? That's paid for with Jewish shekels by a Judean Jew with a clear title he'd do it. You say, where? First Chronicles and Second Samuel. Ever read your Old Testament? He goes up to the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite and says, I'll pay you for that thing. He says, I'll give it to you. He says, no, I'm not going to take it unless it costs me something. And tells you how much he paid for that piece of land. And the first thing is holy in your Bible is a piece of land. And wherever the ark goes, it's holy. And it goes right there. Which means there's going to be a slaughter of well over 400,000 people right in that vicinity. Because all the places the ark goes is holy. And that's my holy hill. Did you read Psalm 2? My holy hill. You know what that hill belongs to? God. The one that made the solar systems. You gonna, you gonna you turn over the Muslims, are you? You gonna lose your shirt. Turn to Jeremiah 25. Jeremiah 25. You're gonna lose your shirt. You're stealing something that doesn't belong to you. Anti-Semitic. Jeremiah 25. You say, why can't they avoid it? Because the Bible says there's going to be a bridle in the mouths of the nation, so they'll have to go the way he sends them. There'll be a bridle. They'll be bridled up, saddled. They'll have to ride his direction. Or Jeremiah 25. Or Jeremiah 25, uh, verse uh, 15. Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand and cause all the United Nations to whom I send thee to drink it. It says all nations. And they shall drink and be moved and be mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Then I took the cup of the Lord's hand and made all the nations, all the nations, all the nations to drink. Uh, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. And all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world which are on the face of this earth, 188 of them, one sack, Verse 27, Drink ye and be drunken, spew, fall, and rise no more, because the sword which I will send among you. And it shall be if they refuse to take the cup at thine hand to drink. They won't take it. Why, it isn't my cup. I'm not going to take it. I mean, God's going to bless us. Then shall say to them, Thus say the Lord, You shall certainly drink. Certainly drink. Verse 20, 32, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coast of the earth, and the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth to the other. And I don't mean Armageddon. That's a minor battle. Only 200 million get killed in that one. This thing is international. He said, wipe out all the nations where that Jew had been. That's 188 nations. Their, their doom is sealed. All right, uh, there, there it is. And uh, that's, uh, there's, your Old Testament is just filled with that. What Christians have done, they've forgotten 500 verses in the Old Testament that are coming, going to come to pass. If the Lord tarries, you're going, they're going to come right to pass with you watching them. I hope the Lord doesn't tarry. On oh, that little history.
A little history. Here's Palestine, and Palestine has never been a, a Palestinian state in the history of the world. The people in there, when Joshua came in, are Jebusites, Amorites, Hivites, Perizzites, and there's no king there, no capital there, no state there. There are 33 kings in that country when Joshua comes in, and they're named. 33 kings, the name of Joshua. It has never been a state. There's no such thing as a Palestinian state that ever existed at any time under any condition. And you take when Rome was in there, Rome ran that place and ran the Jews out and the Turks came in. The Turks took it over. They didn't make any state, didn't make any capital. And the Turks had it until uh, General Allenby came into Jerusalem in 1917, November, under a British mandate, and the British didn't make it a state. And they didn't make any capital for it. That thing has never been a state with a capital except under David and Solomon. Paid for in money by a Judean Jew. Christ said, salvation is the Jews. So every news media out, outlet you have is crooked. All of them. Every one of them. The no such thing as a Palestinian. You know what happened? The Jews came in this place in 1948. You know what happened? How could you know? <laughs> when they came in there, there are Muslims, five Muslim armies attacked that Jew. Up in Syria, Transjordan, Saudi Arabia, and they came to Iraq and Iran and Egypt and attacked that Jew. And when they came in there, they told every Arab in Palestine, get out, and if we catch you in there, we come in, we're going to hang you. As a, as a, as a conspirator with the Jew. 600,000 Palestinians left when the Jews came in. 300,000 stayed. The Jews won the thing, the 300,000 stayed, none of them were hung, and they became citizens, and, and were even given an opportunity to vote which you couldn't do in any country of Muslims ever ran. You couldn't vote for who's going to run you. They could under the Jews. 600,000 left. you know how many came back? Three million. There are three million refugees in Palestine. They weren't born there, weren't raised there, and they constitute terrorist organizations dedicated to genocide. If you give them that thing right there, what you're doing is arming Islam to kill Jews. I got 13 statements by Islam's leaders from 13 different countries where every one of them says our goal in getting a capital is to get rid of every Jew in the land. Hitler called out Juden Ryan, free of Jews. That's the position. This guy here is a Nazi who lived in Germany. And Arafat is his nephew. So he wants his Palestinian state set up there so he can kill every Jew in the land. You don't have peace talks for those kind of people. They tried it with Hitler. If you just give me, you know, the uh, Rhineland, I'll quit. <laughs> but he didn't. Well, now, if you just give me uh, Austria, I'll quit. But he didn't. Now, if you just give me the Sudetenland and Czechoslovakia, I'll quit. But he didn't. Well, if you just give me the, Pol the Danish corridor, the corridor, the Danzig corridor to Poland, I'll quit. But he didn't. Brethren, the only thing that men learn from history is that men never learn from history. You're seeing the thing right now, and right now, Bush and Blair are sitting down to find how much more to give Muhammad in order to avoid war. That's what you did with Hitler for 10 years, and then you had the biggest war you ever saw. All, Jews, all the Jews have right now is this piece of land right here. And then into Jerusalem like that, and then out like that, and then around the Gaza Strip, and down here like this, and that's all they've got. They've got less than half the land God gave them. This is called the West Bank. That West Bank is three million Muslims. And not one of them has any business being there. You got Galatians, that thing in Galatians? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. She has no business there. Get her out! Who's going to do it? Nobody. Now see that thing right there? That's all that Jew has. And this whole thing was his in here. And when Churchill sat down in 1921 with the Arabs and the Catholics in Egypt at Cairo, he took out a pen and he wrote down there, all this land over here on this side of Jordan belongs to Muhammad and Islam. And the Lord said, you think you never saw the sun set the British Empire? Well, honey, you're going to wash her sink. And that was the end of the British Empire. But the news media makes these gods, like FDR and JFK and Churchill smoking his cigar. He wasn't an Episcopalian, he was a Druid. 
I've got two of my young men that have been over there in England now for 10, 15 years to check all this stuff out. He's a druid. That old boy, in one stroke of his pen, he lost China and Malay and Singapore and India and Rhodesia. Just that quick. The Bible says, I'll bless those that bless thee and curse those that curse thee. People, England today is a fifth-rate world power. Don't you know that? There was a time the sun never set in the British Empire. It sets now. Russia, Russia's ahead of England. Germany's ahead of England. Japan's ahead of England. We're ahead of England. Australia's ahead of England. It's a fifth-rate world power. The book, the, the world that gave you a King James Bible. What happened? They turned against that Jew. In 1921, the Jews started going back and he published a white paper in 1929 where when the Jews got back there, they couldn't get off and land on the beach. The barbed wire concentration camps on the beach in 1929 before Hitler ever got to be a oh, head of the German people. Did you ever see the movie Exodus? That the British stopping the Jews from getting back to the homeland. And the Lord said uh, to Herr Goering, Hey, fat, I got a job for you. And Goering said, Was is that? <laughs> And the Lord said, I want to have you go and bomb Coventry off the map, okay? Befail this, befail, an order's an order. And away she went. Now we've got to wind this thing up. These are people that led the Jews in the days after that, after 1948, when they got back. That's the military commander, Moshe Dayan, the fellow with the black patch over his eye. He gets his instructions on Blitzkrieg from German SS officers. And after World War II, some of the SS really repented. They did. And to show the defense, they went down to Israel and built Israel an army and showed them how to handle it. They showed them to go into the radar, showed them how to put a bomb out there on a runway where it blew up later when you're trying to clear the runway of bombs. They helped them out. And those are those wars. These are the attempts, summits, to bring peace to Palestine by giving more and more of Israel to the Mohammedans every time they met. The Islam lied in all three of those meetings and didn't tell the truth one single time. Just took more land, took more land, took more land. All right, we've about got it here, I think. Uh, here's a... Oh, by the way, you know what this land is here on the East Bank that Churchill gave away? That's uh, Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh. That's mentioned in Numbers and Joshua. But who reads Numbers and Joshua? Some of you haven't read Numbers in Joshua. I bet you for 25 years. That's the land grant that Churchill gave the Muslims. It's Jewish land for the tribes. And it's where the Ark of the Covenant went. Right up through there and right across Da. Like that. All right, now here's some place you didn't know about. Golan Heights. That's the place up in here where whoever has the high ground can shoot artillery and rockets down on the Jewish people. And that, that was given way, given to Muhammad uh, at one of those meetings there. That's called the Golan Heights. This is called the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip is this thing right along here, which is right in the middle of the land of Palestine, but that's Arafat's uh, uh, terrorist quarters. And when his boys go out and run and make a hit, they come back and hide in there. And one time they had a terrible time, and about 18 of them had to hide, so they went to the best place to go, and that's the place where Arafat's wife went to church the Church of the Nativity. That's why the terrorists went in there. Because the Arafat and the Pope are just like that. You know what the Pope says? The Pope said it's not only illegal to give Jerusalem to the Jews, but it's immoral. Now listen, people. I know you want to get along, folks, and keep your image up and keep your income coming. I know you Yankees. I know you. You want to keep things going just right for, for, you know, for, for certain reasons. But let me tell you something. When a pop-bellied, lying, Bible-rejecting reprobate gets up there and tells you that God is immoral and, repro and, and is illegal and immoral, you need to kick him off the throne. I don't care if your mother's a Catholic. She ought to have better sense. Amen! <laughs> I mean, folks don't amen me. See, I amen myself. If nobody amen me, I'll amen myself. I know a good preach. Just because a man is a pope, you think he has a right to say that? After that book tells you a hundred times that land belongs to the Jew, and the Lord calls it my land, and says, I gave it to my people. Not one Catholic or one Arabian has any business in Palestine for anything in that book. 
Now, what you got to do, Christian, is get rid of that book to get along. You want to get along? Burn your Bible. But you're not going to, you're not going to, you're not going to go with that book and get along with the world anymore. You got a political issue to deal with. And there it is, boy, just hot as a poker. <laughs> See, Eastern Gate? Cemented shut back in the Crusades. Nobody's ever been through it since. Kaiser Wilhelm was going to come through there on a white horse when he won World War I, but he lost it. You know why you can't get that gate now? Because it's cemented shut. You know what Ezekiel said about that gate? He said nobody can pass through it because the prince went through it. So the guys who cemented it shut didn't even know they were fulfilling Scripture. Said Eastern Gate, sitting over there. When the Lord comes back, he comes back in the Mount of Olives, and he goes right slap through that Eastern Gate. You say, why? Because cement ain't going to bother him a bit. <laughs> Didn't you read about the doors being shut and him coming through the doors? But here's the terrible part of it. Do you know what is right there? A Muslim graveyard. So when the Lord comes on his white horse, Arabian stallion, thoroughbred, he trumps on Muhammad's people, chum, 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 right over the dead bodies. That's what the Lord thinks of the Holy Koran. Whether you think anybody or not. I gotta close. We'll close Isaiah 63. We gotta close here. Run a little over time. It's too much to cover. Just too much. But Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63. That's the Lord finishing off the people he said he'd finish off. Isaiah 63. Who is this that cometh from Eden with dyed garments from Bozrah? He that is striving the, the strength and I, the speaking righteousness, mighty to save. How come your garments are all red like that, like somebody tread the wine fat on the grapes? He, he said, because I've been stomping on people. We'll read it there, Isaiah 63, verse 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And he says, I'm going to trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be upon my garments. Now, you had some dumb Yankee up here that wrote a song that said, he is tramping out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. And she thought it was Southerners. <laughs> Stupid old bag. <laughs> you know who you're going to stomp out? Every nation. Every nation that mess with that Jew. Where that Jew had been. Nothing is over. He's going to be king of kings and lord of lords. And Zechariah says he's going to sit down on the throne of David on the top of the mosque of Omar. And old Muhammad better bow down, or Rasulilala Shihad al Mohammed. He better bow and hit the dirt, baby, because <laughs> the King of Kings is coming. Okay, that's enough for a while. We're <laughs> going to warm up here. <laughs> yeah. I get the mic, sir. Yes, yes. I have gone back to the bathroom with them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and the seventh month for a Jew, around September 23rd, 24th, is the day that the earth is four days off the center of the sun.